I had a guy jump all over me not too long ago and about giving. He said, you know, I give like you told me to give, but bless God, I, I, don't, I don't receive like you said. I didn't get no 30, 60, and 100 fold. I just looked at him and smiled. I said, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. I said, you believe the anointing of God's on me? Yeah. I said, now don't lie to me, because you lie to anointed man. You know what happened to people that lie to anointed people? It's in the book of Acts, Jack. You better listen to it. Tell me the truth. And he said, what? I said, are you a tither? Do you tithe? I'm not talking about this hit and miss jump. I'm talking, are you a faithful tither? Do you faithfully tithe to your church? You faithfully tithe to God, do you? Don't lie. The anointing's here. <laughs> he just looked at me and went, well, well, well. Not all the time. I looked at him, I said, brother, you think God going to give you a hundredfold when you're stealing 10%? I said, you think, you think he going to give you 36 and a hundredfold and he can't trust you with 10%? Huh? I said, let me tell you what you are. And I said it loud. Thief! Thief! He goes, oh, but just, whoa. thief! That, he's a thief! Well, truth is truth. You think God going to give you a hundredfold return when you're stealing 10%? My God, if he gave you a hundredfold return, you wouldn't be at the West Coast Believers Convention. You'd be in Vegas <laughs> saying, hit me, hit me. <laughs> Blow on that. <laughs> Come on, baby. <laughs> well, I can tell there's a bunch of ex-heathens in here, couldn't I? I can tell that. <laughs> God can't give you a hundredfold, 30 or 60-fold if you're stealing 10%. You see... God is looking, not looking for a spokesman. He's looking for a mouthpiece. Someone that will open up their mouth and let God fill it. What do you say? But to understand what God is saying, you got to meet God. Meeting God does not give you words. When you meet God, silence comes upon you. I don't care who you are. When you stand before an almighty Jehovah Jireh, you're not going to go, hey, God, how you doing? I tell you, you know what you're going to do? Uh, utterings and groanings that cannot be mentioned. What happens when you meet God? Meeting God doesn't give you words. Meeting God enjoins silence. You listen. When you meet God and he speaks, faith is created. Faith comes by hearing. You understand? The reason why some of you people can't seem to get an answer to prayer because you talk too much when you should be listening. And the reason why God can't say nothing to you, how he's going to get in there? How he's going to get some words into your conversation? You say, God, if I don't hear from you today, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. It looks bad. It looks bad. Have you seen it lately? Hey, God, we've all done that at times. I, I, you know, from South Louisiana, when my mother and father changed religion, we were Christian Catholics. And we, I wasn't immersed. I was sprinkled as a small, as a baby. And then when my mother and father, we went from a Catholic to a Baptist, which is culture shock. That's, that's great, because you go from catechism to training union. And that's strange. That's strange. You go from a 28 to 30 minute service, which is a mass, to an hour service, which is how can you stay an hour in church? And we went to the Baptist church. It was in there an hour. I thought, that preacher's watch must be broke. We've been in here an hour. Then daddy got filled with the Holy Ghost, and when you go over them places, you might as well just throw your watch away because you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> I seen kids sleeping underneath pews and chairs. I said, boy, these people believe in this stuff. Now, when you learn to pray in a Catholic church, you pray what you call certain prayers, our Father prayer and Hail Mary prayer, our Father. And actually, you don't say it like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You don't say it like that. What you do, if you're a true Catholic, and thank God the Catholics today are really learning how to pray. But when I was a small boy, you prayed like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Oh, Hail Mary, Lord, Jesus, Oh, Hail Mary, Lord, Jesus, Oh, Jesus, Oh, Jesus, Oh, Jesus, Oh, Hail Lord, Jesus, and I'm not making fun of that. Just, how many people know what I'm talking about? Y'all did it, yeah. Now, today they pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, they're in Bible studies and speaking in tongues. But in those days, you prayed as fast as you could because you wanted to get out of there. 
Now, when my mother and father changed over to the Baptist, this yeah, but what if? They prayed prayers like, oh, Lord Jesus, bring us the sheaves. And I used to say, what is a sheave? I didn't know what a sheave was. Those were strange words to me, sheaves? And they sang, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheep, boom. we shall come. And people play piano like this. Bringing in the sheep, bringing in the sheep. You know, that's, then they'd say, let's pray. There may be one here that might want to make a public profession of your faith. And I never heard those words, public profession of my faith. Would you like to get saved? And I would say, from what? <laughs> I did not understand that. Then my mother and father went over into the Pentecostal ranks, and they prayed totally, completely different. They prayed like as if God was deaf. <laughs> they prayed like this. God? Oh, God! Oh, God! God, God, <laughs> boy, and I'd say, Phew. and I could just hear God going, what, <laughs> what? And then if you went over to the black churches, they played them, they prayed them, please pray, please, 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 dun, 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 dun. I said, that's one of them Jane Brown Augusta prayers, that's what that is. They prayed in priest. And the way they prayed was actually, there was a, a line of, yeah, but what if? In all those prayers. So you thought I was off the sermon. No, I wasn't. <laughs> See, it was that, yeah, but what if in there? And they got exactly that ingredient. Sometime he did. Sometime he didn't. Because it was sandwiched in like a slice of Swiss cheese. You don't see, you don't look for that much. You look for the meat and the bread. But that was in there, and it produced spokesmen instead of mouthpieces. Now, when you stand before God, men who are silent before God will have great compelling power before men. If you want great compelling power before people, you must be silent before God so you have something to say. See, people who are silent before God will have great compelling power before men because they've stood in the presence of God. Yeah, but what if? What if that faith stuff doesn't work? What if I give all my money and I go broke? Well, you can't get any lower, so what you worried about? <laughs> but what if you get blessed in the city, blessed in the field? Is God's work a gambling situation? No, it isn't. The Bible said what you sow is what you reap. Now, the church world for centuries, what I mean by the church world, I'm talking about the corporate church world, everyone that calls themselves Christians, they all believe in sowing. Every church I know believes in giving, but not every church I know believes in receiving. But they'll tell you to give. They'll get on that and put that, put that camera by my face. They'll tell you, I tell you, won't you help us? Won't you help me? Won't help me? Hold my hands up. Hold my arms up. Hold my leg up. Hold something up. Bless God, I need help. If we don't hear from you today, we're going off there. Well, go ahead. <laughs> when I see that, I go, I'm going to get his time because he ain't paying his bills. You see, they'll tell you, sell your house, bless God. Do what you got to do, but give. Now, when you do that and you start getting blessed, oh, oh, Lord, then here it comes. You start getting blessed to go, oh, 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 Lord, oh, we bless, oh, good. Hide this stuff, hide this stuff. Get it on, get, oh, Lord, sell the car, sell the car. Let's buy us a pickup truck with three tires on it. <laughs> we'll, put, we'll put a crutch on the back of it and make it do this. <laughs> Can't buy no new truck. Oh, no, no. Why do people get all bent out of shape when you start receiving when the opposite of sowing is receiving? I'll tell you why. Yeah, but what if you consume that stuff upon your own lust? 
You never got that far. What are you worried about? <laughs> You'll never get that far because you don't believe and receive it. So how could you ever consume it upon your own lust? But if I understand my Bible, the Bible said we're the seed of Abraham, the blessings of Abraham are ours, but why? So we can be a blessing. Not just so we can be blessed, so we can be a blessing. Like Brother Jerry blessing that lady. Now, you, did you see, you saw that woman? She went, oh! <laughs> Brother Jerry said, <laughs> like, yeah, we, we got a problem here? We ain't got no problem here. See? Now, if you're not blessed, you can't be a blessing. Now, the reason why we're blessed is because we've been silent before God. The reason my brother Copeland's on all these television stations and all these <laughs> daily TV, I tell you something, it's so funny. I was in a hotel, must have been, I don't know, three months ago, two or three months ago, and I was on the second floor. Now, and it was a motel, not a hotel, excuse me, it's a motel where you drive up. And there was this little save made. Now, I was in room 212. It started down at 201. So I went out and jog. I'm a jogger, you know, and I was running. So I come around like that. And as I was, I got up on the second floor and I, I passed her cart. She had pulled the curtains back, and that was Gloria Copeland. And I looked and I saw this, this little maid looking at Gloria like this. And I noticed that the room was already clean. So they leave, the, normally when they clean the room, they leave the curtains open. I'm talking about, you know, that the bed's made. And I said, look at that. Hmm. Well, I went to my room. I showered. Not, I didn't shower. I just grabbed a wet towel. And I said, ah, feeling good. I think I'm going to do another mile. I walk out, and the lady got her caught at the next room with the doors wide open, got Gloria on that television. <laughs> so I walked through the thing like this, <laughs> and there's Gloria on this in room 201, and now Gloria is in room 202. <laughs> I look at that thing. Thank you. Look at it. And I said, excuse me, ma'am. Uh, she said, are you in 212? Yeah. She said, do you want me to clean your room now? I said, if you don't mind. She said, okay. She, she leaves the room. She takes a car, pushes it, and she comes to my room, and she turns on the television. Now Gloria is on 212. <laughs> on 201, 202, 212. I said, is this whole wing you got to clean? She said, yes, and I'm trying to watch it. She said, excuse me. And so she laughed, and I didn't know. That woman, she said, I, she didn't want to miss anything Gloria said. From 201 to 212, she turned on the television. We had Gloria from one end of that wing to the other. <laughs> so you'd walk by the window, that's Gloria. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you. <laughs> Next one. <laughs> she comes back from her. She said, when well, I got to go back and get towels. So, you know, she just looked. She didn't miss any of the program. And Gloria prayed. She said, now let's pray. So I'm standing there watching Gloria. I'm about ready to tell her that I know Gloria. I hadn't said that. And she said, and, and Gloria said, let's pray right now. And the little maid grabbed my hand. Pray. <laughs> so I just prayed with her. I just prayed with her. I said, you're a Christian. She said, oh, yes, I'm a Christian. I love the Lord with all my heart. Are you saved? <laughs> just straight. I said, yes, ma'am. I give you one better. I know Gloria Copeland. You know, I said, I've slept at her house. <gasps> she wanted to kiss my hand. Get your kid off. It, it almost, I said, no. I said, I, I said, I'm gesturing the plant. Now, my hair was all sweaty. I looked like a dog. She went, you that little white-headed preacher. <laughs> I said, yes, my name's Jerry Savelle. No, no, I, <laughs> I No, I didn't. <laughs> I said, no, my name is Jesse the Planet. What I noticed about this woman, she didn't care what anybody thought about her. She didn't have the, yeah, but what if the manager comes up and see me watching Gloria Copeland while I'm cleaning the rooms? She had Gloria on every, you had to, you had to watch Gloria from 201 to 212. <laughs> it was fun. It was like being in a television studio with monitors. Gloria, Gloria, glory to God. Just, okay, walk back down. You can see all those televisions on. Yeah. She didn't have the, yeah, but what if some syndrome. She didn't care. What do you say? Moses says, God, I can't do this. Well, it's better to try and fail than to escape failure by never trying. I'd rather fall on my face trying to do something than sit back in the church of unbelief all my life and never do anything. Because if I fall on my face, I got a God that'll forgive me and I can wash the mud off and get up and go again. You understand? But if I understand the word of God and get rid of the yeah, but what if syndrome, I won't fall on my face. 
Because Peter said, if you do these things, that's another scripture. He said, you shall never fall. All you got to do is go do these things. That's in, in Peter. And you shall never fall. So it's better to try and fail than to escape failure by never trying. Now, you see, this man told God, Moses said, I, I don't talk very good. See, God's not interested in, in how you say it. He's just interested in your mouth. See, Moses was thinking, to get Pharaoh's attention, I got to have some speech and some personality. To separate speech from personality is to produce loss of power. See, we think we need all these things to get God's work done. No, we don't. All we need is one ingredient. It's called obedience. Once we flow in that obedience, our faith will stand with us. God's faith will stand with you. See, every person that does not try to reach his best has failed to fulfill his purpose in creation. Let me say that again. Every person that does not try to reach his best has failed to fulfill his purpose in creation. I've got everything I do, I've got to do it the best I can. The best I can. I don't care what it takes. I'm going to do it the best I can. Now, some other people's best is better than my best. See? But that's okay. It don't make no difference. God loves us all. He's no respect to person. There's some people way higher qualified than I am to do a certain thing. But that doesn't make any difference. If I've done my best, God judges me on best, on my work, to accomplish what he asked me to do because I never had the yeah, but what if, see? So when I get rid of yeah, but what if, then I fulfill my purpose in creation. But when you say, you know, Lord, I really can't do this kind of stuff, you know what that is? That's false modesty. False modesty has caused more evil than overwhelming conceit. Let me say that again. False modesty has caused more evil than overwhelming conceit. See, conceited people are made sane by life's lessons. You get these conceited people, they're going to run into enough walls that will knock the conceit out of them. <laughs> they're going to learn by life's lessons. When you think you got it, you just find out you don't. See, they're going to learn. See, life's lessons are going to teach conceited people. But false modesty has caused more evil than overwhelming conceit simply because that person that God chose refused to do it knowing because of the yeah, but what if syndrome, I don't know if God would or if I can. And that's a false modesty. Why would God take time out of his busy schedule to talk to you and tell you to do something if he wouldn't empower you to do it? He said he went with the disciples confirming the word with signs, wonders. Those guys couldn't do that stuff. Yeah, but there's so many different types of people. Ladies and gentlemen, I have made up my mind that there's 12 tribes in the nation of Israel and if you think about the church, <laughs> we're made up of those 12 tribes. Now, to get the church complete in its manifestation, you got to have all 12 tribes. Now, you understand, so why are some people aggravating? Well, they may be of the tribe of Reuben. Reuben, Bible said he's unstable, like water. What? <laughs> you say, I'd like to get rid of him. No, no, no. You got to understand, Reuben is the one that saved Joseph's life. See, we need Reuben. You might be a Dan. Everybody want to be a Joseph, a fruitful bough, hanging over the wall. Everybody want to be a Joseph. Glory to God. I had one man say, I'd like to be of the tribe of Judah. Really? Judah's the one that told Reuben to sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites. <laughs> now, if you go to Genesis 49, you'll find out all these different tribes and what, they, uh, what their personality is. You got to understand, every church, every convention, every meeting has 12 tribes in it. You'll have some people go, glory to God, hallelujah, just believe in us. I'll tell you one thing, I just don't know about that kind of stuff. Well, you don't throw them out because they may be of the tribe of Reuben. They may be of the tribe of Dan. See? But it takes all those tribes to make the nation of Israel. Well, you understand what I'm saying? So you got to remember, every one of those tribes got a good quality. If we would just focus on the goodness of people instead of on the badness, but the problem is image. We've built an image. And, you know, I heard Elvis Presley say years ago that it's very hard to live up to an image. You see, the image is wanted by the world. Integrity is wanted by God. And that's what's happened to this situation here about this great American hero. Everybody's shocked because, you see, they built an image. Now, the people that knew a little things about him, that integrity wasn't there in terms of domestic uh, violence. I mean, as a, you know, because I, I believe in being innocent till proven guilty. I believe that. Most people don't believe that, but I, you're innocent till you're proven guilty. If you live in America, you ought to believe that. 
You got to understand that the first thing to fail or the first thing to fall in the media is the truth. Very first thing. They're interested in a story. If you get killed and they got good ratings, they don't care. They're interested in ratings. That's why they can put the worst junk on. I heard a preacher this morning on Good Morning America say, my God, if President Bush and all these other people would have done what our president's done, y'all would be chewing him alive. Oh, man, get the guy off the thing. They don't want it? Because that doesn't bring good news. You see, oh, what I mean, good ratings. They want roughness. I made up my mind. I've had a lot of people always want to interview me. I said, what do you want to know me for? What you need to know is Jesus. Well, are you trying to hide something? I said, no, I'm talking to you. <laughs> You're the one that's got stuff to hide, not me. I said, now, if you want to talk to me, we're not going to talk on this beta cam. We're going to talk live. In other words, if Channel 6 News is on now, you want to talk to me? Talk to me now. Don't get this tape and bring it back to an edit shop and make me say something that I didn't say. During the scandals, when the scandals were going strong, I got hit with a live, thank God it was a live cam. Well, Reverend Duplantis, what do you think about the scandals and the different things of the evangelist? Now, we live in the Channel 8, ABC, do all that. We on, you know, because you, know, you got the, 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 the head person and they'd say, they, they, they named this field opera. What, what does this man have to say? And I said, has any of y'all ever committed adultery? Now, they couldn't edit that. We lied. I said, have you? Have you ever committed? How about you, sir? Have you committed adultery? Tell me and tell the world. Remember, your wife is watching. Well, they don't interview me anymore. Now, they want to interview me with a beta cam. They want to interview me where they can take a thing, bring it to an editor, chop this, chop that. Ask me a totally different question because they already know what I'm going to say. So I prefer to talk live. They get nervous when you're on live because you see they can't produce, yeah, but what if? Truth is coming. Let me say this in close. You cannot explain one's magnitude of achievements by looking at who they are. You got to remember, every person God chose from the outside, don't look like they can do the job. You ever notice that? Let me say it again. You cannot explain one's magnitude of achievements by looking at who they are. Eloquence of deeds always overrides eloquence of looks. The acts of the apostles instead of the words of the apostles. It, it is ignorant. It is the ignorant who do not want to be enlightened. We are all dealing with image. Sad to say, even in the Christian ranks, we think if we don't look right, smell right, talk right, do right, be right, why would God choose this person? Because you see, we think this is what it takes to touch the world through cameras. No, it doesn't take eloquence of looks. It takes eloquence of deeds. God used the man called John the Baptist who didn't look good, didn't smell good. He was always around water. He wore camel hair in the Middle East in the hot desert. <laughs> Tough. Boy, didn't eat too well. He, he must have thought he did. He ate locusts and wild honey. Probably the first Cajun to ever be born, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Stuck out there, holler. Sure didn't look the type. But his eloquence of deeds shocked the world. Jesus said he's the greatest prophet ever lived. Talk about a preaching machine. Preach hell so hot you can smell smoke when you get around. He had a message. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He also didn't have false modesty. He said he had true understanding of who he was. He said I must decrease and he must increase. Yeah, but what if, John, all your followers, all your pardoners go with Jesus? So, don't make no difference. I'm sent here to do a purpose. I've done my best. I have fulfilled my purpose in creation. Now, why could that man preach like that?
because he was silent before God, but he had great compelling power before men to the point that Jesus would go listen to the man preach. That man was a preacher. Didn't look right. Didn't even look like Jesus. Jesus looked better than he did. John was one rough-looking character, yet God chose him to be the forerunner of the son of the living God. What are you saying here? John didn't separate his speech from his personality. He said, what you see is what you get. Yeah, but what if that didn't exist in his life until one time in a jail? He said, um, man, you can expect the man's human. He knows that guy Herod want to kill him. He knows that woman Herod's got don't like him at all because he called her an adulterer in front of everybody. You don't scorn no woman because they don't forget. And they're going to get up before you do. <laughs> I'm telling you. He said, ask him if he's the one or should we wait for another? Now, I love Jesus' response to John. Didn't even answer him. He said, since he's in, I'll, I'll paraphrase it. Since John's in the flesh, tell him, go tell him what you see. Blind see, dead raised, devils are cast out. Since you're asking me a flesh statement, I'm going to answer you with a flesh answer. And after he said that, he gave him a great compliment. Did you go to see a reed shaking in the wind? No, no. You saw a post here. But then he said something that really ministered to me. He said, blessed is he who is not offended in me. Has God ever offended you? <laughs> Come on, tell the truth. Has he ever offended you? Tell you one thing, I stood on the word of God and looked like the biggest fool. Well, John was saying, uh, Jesus, can you hurry this thing up? They're going to cut my head off in a few days. Uh, I mean, I saw the Holy Spirit light on you as a dove, not a dove, but as a dove. I heard God say, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. So since you're well pleasing, would you uh, get on with the job of pleasing? Get me out of this hole? See, he was offended. I know what he was thinking. My God, I started the boy off in the ministry. I'm the one baptized him. I'm the one gave him credibility. My God, the whole city come out to see me and come out to see him. You don't think the devil was saying that? Why didn't God choose you? Why'd you have to be born to Elizabeth? Why couldn't you be born to Mary? But he didn't stay there. He rebuked that out of his spirit. Jesus spoke great and well things of John. That's the only failure I see in John in the scripture right there. And the Lord has spoken that, spoken that scripture, that statement to me many times. Jesse, have I offended you? I said, yeah. I look like a fool. He said, you don't go by what you see. You ought to see what I see. If you think you're a fool, you ought to see you through my eyes. I couldn't mention it. What are you saying? What makes you think that is, yeah, but what if? If you find out something about Moses, Moses accepted the challenge. And when he did, God called him the meekest man on all the earth. He's one of the greatest men Israel's history ever talks about, the lawgiver, Moses. And now Moses even instructed Jesus in his earthly ministry with a guy that looked like John called Elijah with three other guys looking on saying, bless God, we'll take the world. And just a few months later, they're saying, I neither know nor understand Jesus. And they all forsook him. Those three, the ones that he was closest to. You know why they forsook him? Yeah, but what if? Aren't you one of them Galileans? See, that's the challenge Satan will use against anything that you're believing God for. He will come with this statement. I've heard Brother Copeland say it, and we use it as a title to this message. Yeah, but what if? Well, yeah, but yeah, but what if does not exist in you? See, let me just tell the devil. You tell the devil this. If he says, yeah, but what if? He says, Satan, it's finished. And if it's finished, there ain't no more yeah, but what ifs. And I walk in the calling God called me to walk in. Stand to your feet and give the Lord a standing ovation. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You enjoyed that? This is the beginning. Yeah, but what if?
Thanks for listening to this powerful message by Jesse Duplantis. Remember to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell in order to be up to date with all things Jesse Duplantis Ministries. For more information, visit our website at jdm.org. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.